Hello. So we are now going to talk on uh, chapter 16, which, which is practicing professional behavior. So this is going to include, oh, this is going to include um, what professional behavior and appearance mean, healthcare diversity and professional communication. We're also going to talk about risk management and stress. So professional behavior. Um, first of all, just kind of think for a quick second here. What images do you associate with professional behavior? All right, think about it. While you're thinking about it, um, professional is, is, is um, defined as an individual who performs a vocation or job that requires specialized educational training. So a phlebotomist, okay? Professionalism, on the other hand, is behavior that exhibits the traits or features that correspond to the models and standards of that profession. These models and standards are developed by professional organizations. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about those as well, some professional organizations and networking actually at the end here. But for example, the ones that relate to you, there's the National Phlebotomy Association, and there's the, the American Society for Clinical Laboratory Science. Um, Often these organizations or you know, the facilities at which you work, maybe within the laboratory, and definitely these professional organizations come, come up with these code of ethics. A code of ethics is a statement adopted by a profession that states the expected professional and personal conduct of its members. And it's a moral framework used to assist professionals in understanding and applying professional behavior in our everyday practices. Um, well, I say in our everyday practice, but also within challenging situations as well. So they're kind of going above and beyond the day to day um, and help us when there's something that's out of the ordinary and requires ethical um, decisions to be made. Both the needs of our community and the culture of our community, the culture of the people we serve, the culture of our co coworkers, our culture, these all play a role in developing standards of professionalism. There are two types of skills needed in any profession, and these are hard and soft skills, okay? Hard skills. These are the technical skills that are required um, for your profession. Their specific training, as well as operational proficiencies within your scope of practice. The these are the, another way to put that is the minimum competencies and proficiencies necessary to do your job. In phlebotomy, it's gonna be dermal and venipuncture, right? Specimen collection also specimen handling and processing, computer data and entry. You have to do all, that's minimal. You have to be able to do all those, be good at them, et cetera. Now, soft skills, um, these are the personal attributes or our personal qualities or behaviors that enhance our interactions, our job performance and our career prospects. These traits are more elusive, more um, or less concrete, right? Characteristics, attributes and attitudes. These are things that we have developed out our lives. So they're all going to be different, right? From person to person, we're all going to have some different things. Respect, dependability, attitude, how we communicate, our integrity. These are the soft skills. Something to kind of, you know, put in your brains here. Hard skills associated with phlebotomy are the reason that we get hired. But it's lack of specific soft skills um, that are the most common reason for termination as a phlebotomist and in other professions as well. Professionalism also involves understanding people who are different from you and respecting their right to be different from us, right? Um, we talked about this a little bit in, in one of our previous lectures. Um, communication is hugely important, especially when we're dealing with different cultures, different backgrounds, different people with different languages than us. Um, Remember, we have to have all pieces of this communication loop to be successful. And that goes what goes for whether there's barriers to communication or not. And we've talk, we talked about communication barriers in our other lecture also, but if I didn't mention it then, let's throw in culture and background, et cetera, okay? We know there's verbal communication. This is the spoken word, the tone of our voice, it's the words we choose, it's our attitude. We also mentioned that there's nonverbal communication. And in our other lecture, we talked a bit about, you know, posture, presenting yourself with confidence, um, making appropriate eye contact. But to go further into that, it's gestures, it's mannerisms, body language, our facial expressions. You know, if you have your arms crossed and you're, you know, give it, you know, talking to somebody, you're automatically going to give off um, maybe a different um, feeling than you are maybe intending to. 
So back to, let me find my spot here. Um, talking again about diversity and times into diversity. Everyone has their own worldview that's shaped by beliefs about health, um, that shape their beliefs, excuse me, about health and disease, how we choose to treat disease or not, and the role of different healthcare providers in our own health. Um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services created the National Standards for Culturally and Linguistically Appropriate Services in Health and Healthcare. I know that's a lot, but it's um, CLAS standards, okay? Um, these were created, though, to help eliminate misunderstandings in healthcare interactions, improve patient compliance, and eliminate healthcare disparities. We've probably all heard the word stereotype, right? They're stereotypes. This is a belief and concept about a specific cultural group of people that are often based on assumptions about that cultural group. So phlebotomists and other healthcare workers have to avoid stereotyping. Um, and that's so important that we make sure we don't make assumptions about people. Even if we, we, we shouldn't even make the assumption when someone is very similar to us. Um, and, and, and that can be kind of a dangerous thing to do. So don't make assumptions, don't stereotype people. Many factors affect the way an in, individual reflect, uh, opt, reflects and acts. This is place of birth, place of upbringing, whether we live in an urban setting or a rural setting, um, family history, social and economic status, our education, our spiritual and religious beliefs, how much time we've been in the United States and our level of acculturation to the American mainstream culture. Acculturation is um, changes made by minority groups in response to the dominant culture. It's, it's kind of adapting to the dominant culture. Uh, let me see. So when caring for individuals, it's important to keep an open mind, be aware of these cultural differences and what communication barriers they might uh, give to us, don't stereotype. We want to always, for each individual, determine the appropriateness of our communication style and modify it as appropriate. We want to um, not assume that patients are familiar with blood or any kind of specimen collection. Respect the patient's right to refuse a procedure after it's been explained to them. Provide opportunities for the patient to feel in control by asking them their preferences. So, you know, we don't walk in and have the patient explain to us how we're going to do our job, but whenever you have the opportunity to give preference and let people have choice, especially when they're hot, sick, and in the hospital, sometimes that, hang, that just little bit of control is so important. So even if you say, you know, is, do you prefer I look at one arm over the other? Um, would, would you like me to get you a little, um, cup of water, you know, beforehand, if you sense that they're nervous or something. So give them some, some, um, a little bit of control. Let's see. Um, don't make, oh, okay, said that already. Don't be judgmental when a patient expresses cultural beliefs that are different from your own. Okay, so um, be empathetic, be culturally aware, be respectful, uh, provide for dignity and privacy and, and, um, and just acceptance, right? Uh, some legal terminology that we're going to talk about real quick because we're going into risk management now. Basically, risk management, um, every hospital, every organization has a risk management department. These are the people that help to develop policies and procedures to protect our patients, our employers, and the employees from loss and injury. So you may have heard the terms liability and litigation, maybe malpractice and negligence. Those are terms you need to be uh, familiar with, okay? Liability. That's the legal, legal obligation to compensate for loss or damage, okay? Litigation is just legal action. Uh, venipuncture pr procedures, if improperly performed, can cause temporary or permanent injury to an extremity and may result in legal action. In addition, most injuries resulting from phlebotomy procedures fall under either malpractice or negligence, which is why those are key terms that you need to know. Malpractice is the incorrect treatment of a patient by a healthcare, healthcare worker, whereas negligence is the failure to perform a reasonably expected duty um, or our reasonably expected duty to the patient. So a bottomist must be aware of the standards of care as well as your boundaries and limitations. So know what you can't do, know what your boundaries and limitations are. 
Attempting a procedure that you aren't fully trained to perform can lead to poor quality care and perceived negligence. So never perform any procedure that you're not fully trained to do. Proper documentation is, is vital in preventing liability. That's why documentation, documentation is so important. Um, you know, it's just as important as performing the, the procedure or the task um, properly and accurately and to the best of our abilities. If something was not document, it did, documented, it didn't happen. So if you come across a situation where something didn't go as it was expected, you wanna make sure you document that as well. Document to protect yourself, document to protect the institution at which you work, and document to protect your patients. Um, HIPAA, and we will talk about HIPAA a little later on in the course as well in more detail, but HIPAA is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. It identifies states that patient identifiers include name, social security, date of birth, address, room number, or anything else that can identify the patient. It is our responsibility as healthcare providers to maintain patient privacy at all times, or we can be held liable. So let's talk a little bit about stress and coping with stress. And that's the last, well, no, that's not, that's, we have, and then we're gonna talk about our professional community as phlebotomists too, but when we're talking about coping with stress, um, so this is your forum this week, and you're gonna also talk about it in your uh, in-person class as well. So we all have stress. Some level of stress is normal. Some level of stress is even good. Being that we work in healthcare, Healthcare workers, including phlebotomists, may experience high levels of stress in the work environment. We need to minimize stress, both for the sake of our own health and to prevent errors, right? Burnout, you guys have probably heard the term burnout. This is the result of a prolonged period of stress without relief. Certain personality types are more prone to burnout. And typically you'll hear um, type A or type B. Uh, it's good to know what kind you are. Um, and, and if I can, I'll come up with a little quiz for that. Um, but knowing if you're a type A or a type B, not one's not better than the other. There's just certain characteristic traits that go along with each personality type. And it's good to know which one you are so that you know how to um, take care of yourself as best as possible. Like I said, a certain amount of stress is, is not bad. Um, the kind that makes you feel excited or challenged and motivate you, that's good stress but ongoing stress that makes you feel overwhelmed and can affect you physically, causing you to be exhausted, uh, sick, that's considered bad stress. Bad stress, in fact, lowers our resistance to colds, infections, and also increases our risk over a long period of heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, ulcers, autoimmune diseases, cancers, et cetera. So it's important also to keep in mind that what's stressful for one person might be normal for another. So stress, just like many other things, are all, um, it, it's about perspective, right? And it's what um, has to do with our culture and our background too. So what is stressful for one may not be for another. But it's important for that reason to understand what causes us stress, because once we can recognize it, we can learn how to manage it better. And then managing stress, that's something that you, you, you guys put in your form as well. Um, we got to know our strengths and weaknesses what our limitations are. So we gotta be realistic about we can, what we can handle, what we can take on and what we can't. Um, pushing ourselves a little bit can be motivating and exciting, but too much, not good for us, not good for our patients. So as you're going through these forums, as we're talking about this in class and as you're reading through it, be thinking about yourself, you know, introspective, think about what can you do? How can you manage your stress? What are things that have worked for you in the past? What are some things that you might be able to try um, that you haven't tried before that could help you to manage stress and release some of that stress? All right. So, oh, yes, in causes of stress, a lot of different things, right? Job changes, learning new things, um, being observed by your supervisor, having state come to your lab in your hospital. Uh, COVID is a big stressor right now, right? There's a lot of things going on. Um, oh, more death of the family member, changes in financial status, um, having a baby. So not all bad things, right? It's not all bad and not all good, but they all add stress. So some methods to manage stress or cope with stress. Um, I mentioned be introspective, let's start thinking about this, but some of the common ones you'll see, um, just taking time for yourself, 
whether that be just sitting and, and having, you know, a cup of coffee on your porch, watching a movie, uh, getting to bed a little bit earlier, doing some exercise, reading, artwork, etc. So before, let me see on my slides, bear with me for a second. Okay. So before I start talking about certification, um, I just want to talk about professional community a little bit because I mentioned that we have our own professional communities as phlebotomists. We, um, we have the National Phlebotomy Association. We have the American Society for Clinical Laboratory Science. Um, phlebotomists are in great need. So our growth rate from 2014 to 2024 is expected to be 25%. A growth rate of 25%. That's huge. So you have jobs. That's a good thing. Job experience and being active within a professional community help to advance your phlebotomy career. Professional communities, in, or yeah, professional community includes professional organizations or societies. Um, certification usually consists of successful completion of an academic training requirement that is then validated through national certification or national examination. That's your NHA certification at the end of this course that you can sit on. Um, the reason we have these certifications is to ensure your ability to perform the necessary competencies to do your job, right? Um, registration means that you are, list, you are on a list that's maintained by an agency or association. Um, licensure is similar to certification, but it's enforced by a governmental agency. Uh, certification, so in this case, certification sometimes is voluntary while as licensure is a mandatory thing. Okay, licensure and certification requirements vary from state to state. So if you get certified as a phlebotomist in North Carolina and you then plan to move, you need to look into the um, transfer of your certifications for whatever job or profession you may be in at that time. Continuing education, there we go. Um, this is education done after professional training, right? Um, as a professional phlebotomist, um, as a professional phlebotomist, continuing education is a lifelong process necessary to stay current in your field. And I see that I had that blank, so I was gonna fill that in with the exact number of hours every year. So I will find that for you guys and I will post it. Um, professional uh, development, yeah. Professional development refers to skills and knowledge attained for personal and, and career development. Um, you can do continue. You're gonna. You have some required continuing education each um, year for being a phlebotomist, but you are also often being cross trained in other areas. And I think that's actually a wonderful thing. It it really it makes you more desirable as an employee. It uh, per, allows for more opportunities for you to do what you want to do to try and do in different things. Um, some jobs that phlebotomists uh, may do, other than phlebotomy only. Um, becoming a certified medical assistant, a registered nurse, um, working in the medical laboratory as, and we talked about this in the very first lecture. That's why I kind of laid it out for you. If you remember, I said, you know, kind of the first level is the phlebotomist or the MLA, and that's the, uh, the, the um, tech level, right? I'm sorry, not the tech level, the assistant level, forgive me. Um, next would be the medical laboratory technician, the MLT, which is the technician level, and that's typically an associate's degree. Then your next level up above that, the medical laboratory scientist, MLS, that's a bachelor's degree or higher. So, um, and then, you know, and, and beyond, I mean, it's kind of the, you know, the sky's the limit. Um, it's great to have the foundation of a phlebotomist. That's such a great foundation. You learn a lot of skills that you can uh, apply to other, other areas in healthcare. It's a great foundation. Um, if you particularly enjoy patient care, you might lean more towards the medical assistants, the nurse. Um, what I thought I had another example on there. Maybe not. There's other examples. If you learn, lean more towards being in the lab setting, that's when you will maybe look at the MLT, the MLS, MLA, et cetera. So finally, um, networking. This is the process of building alliances socially and professionally. Networking is a really valuable tool for your, your career, for advancing your career. Uh, joining and being an active member in one of these professional society, societies that we mentioned is probably the easiest way to network, though there are lots of other ways. I mean, being in class, this is your opportunity to network. Um, you can network with your instructors. You can network with your fellow classmates. When you guys are in your clinical sites, 
network, 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 get names and, and contact information. Show, you know, show that you are punctual, determined, um, eager to learn, uh, skillful. Network now and build that network list as you go along in your career because it's very helpful for finding um, jobs and getting opportunities. Um, all right, I think that's it, you guys. So if you have any other questions about that, um, just let us know. All right, I think that's it. Let me turn this off. And...